Hi, I'm Mickey McGuire from MickeyMcGuirePhoto.com and right now this is a brand new thing for us. We're putting together a YouTube channel specifically to teach people all about landscape photography and to discuss how to make money with your camera while you're waiting to build a name for yourself in landscape because even when Ansel Adams, as famous as he is for landscape was really beginning and through a lot of his career he supported himself by street photography and other means and that's pretty much the way it is with most people who shoot landscape for me it's a passion I started in the early 1970s with medium format I switched to 35 millimeter film in 1976 and continued shooting film until the digital SLR cameras actually hit about six megapixels and then I seriously started looking at digital as a possibility for me. And I went and bought the Pentax IST digital camera, started using it. And at that point, pretty much everything was 6 megapixel. It wasn't long after that the 10 megapixel came out, and then 12 to 14, and 16, and so on. And now we're looking at cameras that are a lot larger than that. But when it comes to landscape photography, most landscape photographers struggle to make any kind of real money and support themselves. It becomes more or less a labor of love and a passion and there's other ways you need to be able to make money in order to support yourself and be a full-time photographer. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to explain what I have here in front of me. You can't see it, it's below the camera line, but I have a lot of equipment that's here and the reason I'm going to do this first and get it out of the way is everywhere I shoot people recognize that I must be a professional because I have a lot of great gear and it all looks expensive and it is and I'm out there with a tripod and I'm doing things creatively that other people just don't do so I'm going to explain this but the first I'm going to start with the cameras that I have then I'm going to talk about some of the lenses I have in front of me and some of the other options that I don't have sitting right here because of limited space. At any rate, this is the camera that I use most often right now. This is a Pentax K1 Mark II. It has been on the scene over a year. The camera is phenomenal. It's 36 megapixel. It's a full frame sensor digital camera. So it is the size of 35 millimeter negative, the, the sensor itself inside this camera. But this camera is designed for a professional. It's a magnesium alloy body. It's very rugged. It's fully weather sealed. And it's phenomenal for landscape for a lot of reasons. And I'm going to cover that within the course of this video. The lens that's on this is a 50 millimeter Pentax all weather lens. It's a 1.4 aperture and it's over a thousand dollars. So, I mean, this is a lens that you're not going to buy to put on some cheap little camera or an old used Pentax digital SLR. It's, it's a serious commitment. And for landscape, the reason I use this as much as I do is because this approximates what the human eye sees. A really wide angle lens isn't the same. They're great, a lot of landscape photographers use them, and I'm going to be buying actually one very, very soon. I haven't been using the one that I'm going to be getting, but I'm looking at the 15 to 30 millimeter wide angle so that I can capture really, really big landscapes in vertical format to show great depth and wide gulps for things like rock formations and stuff like that that I'm going to be doing quite a bit. This camera though is designed for the working pro. It's heavy and with this lens on it, this is probably about four pounds worth of camera and lens. So it's not something that you're going to use lightly. You're going to be putting a good investment in this and you're going to be carrying it around. So that's why I have a strap and I always use a strap on my cameras because I see a lot of people walking around with just holding it in their hand. That may be fine for really avid bird photographers where a flap, a flapping uh, strap in the wind can spook off some very skittish songbirds. For me, I still take the chance because you know what, I'll use a long lens, but I want to make sure my camera is safe. So this thing stays around my neck most of the time when I'm out walking around hiking and taking pictures. The next I'm going to show you is the Pentax KP. My wife fell in love with this camera, so she is using it most of the time nowadays. But it is my backup camera. 
Now, this camera here is the professional model of an APS-C sensor, and it was the flagship APS-C camera from Pentax until very recently, where the K3 Mark III has been introduced to replace this. The KP Mark III is 25 megapixel. This is 24 megapixel. So what do you get, you know, with that camera that makes it so compelling? Because this is already a great camera. And for only one pixel more, you know, one megapixel more, do you really want to spend $2,000 on a replacement for this camera? Well, I'll tell you what the difference is between this and the K3 Mark III. The ISO sensitivity of this camera comes in over 800,000. The ISO sensitivity on the K3 Mark III is 1.6 million. That is a first. No other camera in the industry, period, can touch that. What it does for light sensitivity and what it does overall up the scale is amazing because this in low light is a phenomenal camera. That in low light is even better. It's smoother. You see almost no noise up to like 57,600 ISO, which is incredible. And no other camera can really make that claim. You would think that it would be not as smooth, let's say, as the full-size K1 Mark II that I have sitting here that I just showed you. But yet, at the same time, the noise is so low on the K3 Mark III from the results I've seen already, although I haven't used it myself, it is astoundingly smooth and very, very little noise. People have used it with decent usable results way past 57,600 ISO. So this is an incredible breakthrough in technology, and I'm looking forward to getting my hands on one. Now the lens that's on this camera, the KP, it's a 300 millimeter f4 lens. This is one of the clearest lenses Pentac makes, if not the clearest lens that they make, and I have not had any color fringing at all with this camera, no matter what I've done with it. Now my wife loves photographing treetops for some reason. She's really into treetops with, you know, flowering trees and stuff in particular. And she's shooting straight up in the sky where literally the tree limbs are right against the blue sky and there's no fringing at all. I was looking at the shots she just did this past weekend and it's amazing to me how well this camera handles that. There is no fringing that I've seen on anything we've shot and that is incredible. Now, f4 is a fast lens when you're talking about a super telephoto. 300 millimeter is a telephoto lens, but this is not a zoom. If you need to move in and out to get closer or farther from your target, you have to use what we used to call the sneaker zoom, just foot power. Get closer to your subject or farther away. I've shot wild turkeys with this thing from a pretty good distance and I was enormously successful and turkeys are very sharp-eyed and skittish so the fact that I could do that with this camera lens that says something. Another great workhorse lens that I have and I use this because it will handle full frame as well as crop sensor cameras this is the Pentax 70 to 210 f4 aperture now the 7210, or the 7200 rather, 2.8 aperture is a phenomenal lens. What I did, because I shoot mostly landscape and wildlife, I don't really have to do much these days with sports action and other things, and I have lenses that will handle it anyway, but when I bought this lens, it was because I saved $800 by buying the F4 70-210. Now, for full disclosure, let me tell you, the, the outer casing of this, the barrel itself, it's made by Tamron. But just so you realize this, don't let that stop you from buying this. First off, it's a metal casing, it's very durable, it's practically indestructible. It's weather sealed, which is a Pentax thing, but all of the elements in this lens and all the coatings are Pentax. Tamron is building it for Pentax using Pentax glass. It is not the same elements, lens groups, that you see in the Tamron version of this lens. So while they look alike on the outside, 
this is a different lens on, under the hood. Just be very clear on that. I have not had any fringing at all with this. I've had fantastic results. The image quality is great. And you will be seeing those in other episodes. The other thing about this lens, and I want to be clear about this too, this tripod mount that is here did not come with the lens. This is the tripod mount that is sold specifically for the Tamron F4 version of this lens. I bought this from BH Photo for about $136, $139, somewhere around there. It fits this perfectly because it is made for this outer housing and it is sold as something to use for the Tamron version of the lens. It works for the Pentax and I actually found out on the Pentax forum when I was looking for something for this and I found out I could get this from BH Photo so I grabbed it. I'd highly recommend it because this is a nice big lens. I don't want to shoot this handheld for what I do. The reason is because I want the clearest, sharpest images possible so I don't rely on image stabilization even though it's built in the camera body of both of these cameras. I don't take any chances. Some other lenses I have sitting here I'm going to explain. Okay, this right here is the Pentax 100 millimeter macro. It is a weather resistant lens. I've had fantastic results with this and again I haven't had any fringing on this thing to date. I've been using it for botanical images. I love wildflowers and photographing flowers and gardens and things like that. And I'm going to be showing some videos on that too because a lot of people shoot just a single flower all the time and they miss flower groupings and things that actually are more interesting and usually outsell just a single big flower image. So this is what I'm using a lot for botanical images these days. Now I will show you another lens real fast that I used to use a lot for botanical stuff. This is a Tamron 28 to 75 millimeter f 2.8 aperture lens. People have had mixed reviews with this lens. Some people have had a very high degree of success with it, including me. Other people have gone through several of them and found issues. So quality control was a bit of an issue at one time. Now, to be quite frank, Tamron has really stepped up their game. And today they're, produ they're producing world-class glass under the Tamron name. So don't shy away from it. Give them a try and take a look at them. They really are worthwhile. Next lens I'm going to show you, this is a 50 millimeter macro Pentax lens. It's 2.8 aperture. I bought this to use a little bit and then I grabbed the 100 millimeter and I preferred it because with this thing your focus distance is as close as 10 inches to your subject. And I've got this thing about photographing big bumblebees and butterflies and butterflies are a little skittish if you get too close and big bumblebees well you know they're usually intoxicated by pollen but if they get cranky I want a little bit of distance between me and them so my wife is using this lens and she's getting really a lot of success with it this is a fantastic little lens but it is not weather sealed so that's something to keep in mind it is an FA lens it will work on a full frame sensor that's great. So if you have a K1, this is a good lens to use. But if it starts to rain, you want to cover this thing or take it off, replace it with another lens. I'm going to mention this one because it's in my wife's bag and I had one of these also and I sold it along with a camera body rather than the kit lens like the 18 to 55 you normally see with Pentax these days and Canon and Nikon for that matter. This lens is a 50mm 1.8 aperture lens. Now the 1.4 aperture lens of a similar size and configuration is a little bit soft at 1.4 and 1.8. It sharpens up by the time you get to 2.8 and it's a good lens at 2.8. This lens at 1.8 is amazingly clear. I haven't had any issues at all with softness corner to corner on this lens. It's quick, it's very lightweight, it's ED glass. They did not skimp on, on the elements of this thing. This is a really nice little lens. And I saw it today on Amazon at $116.
If you don't have one of these and you're using a crop sensor Pentax camera, you owe it to yourself to buy one of these. I mean, seriously, at 116 bucks, this is a can't miss. 1.8 aperture. I've had some amazing portraits. I've shot with one of these. Next thing I'm going to talk about real fast is the rear teleconverter. That's the autofocus model, the 1.4 that Pentax is producing right now for APS-C size sensors. I'm going to try this with a full frame lens. I want to see if there's any darkening in the corners. If not, then it would almost be like a, a lens extender technically the way this thing is made because it is very, very small and it keeps you close to the camera body. It's supposed to be for APS-C Hence the Pentax DA 1.4 XAW. It is a weather sealed, all weather lens here. The, the O rings on this thing will keep you dry in the worst weather. That's why the AW instead of WR designation. It's not just weather resistant, it's an all weather lens. These things are about 450 bucks right now. Is it worth it? Oh, yeah. If you can get 40% more in the length of your lens, we're talking about something like this on this body here with this 1.4 teleconverter. It brings this to 630 millimeters because it's 450 millimeter on a crop sensor body for this lens. It's a 300 millimeter, so add 150, 150%. You're talking about 450. You put this on there, it brings it to 630. That is one really nice combination. And I've had some great shots of birds in the backyard and out in the wild with this combination when I was using this camera all the time. I will say my chances of using this camera much anymore is probably slim to none because my wife has fallen in love with this thing and pretty much it's hers at this point. So I may grab another one as a backup at some point just to have and to shoot with some longer glass but I will say this the the KP is a heck of a camera and if you want one you better grab it quick because once the K3 Mark III is widely available I'm hoping it comes down in price because it is a phenomenal camera I wouldn't mind having one myself but two thousand dollars is pretty steep when I paid a little less than that for the K1 uh, K1 Mark II rather I want to talk about a couple other things real fast when it comes to equipment. First off, camera bags. I love shoulder bags. I always have, I always will. And I used a low pro for years. When it was pretty much wearing out, I wanted to get something new. And because of the amount of gear I carry with me, I ended up opting for a backpack. So I looked at low pro and some of the others, and the price of the low pro bags, like $180 in a lot of places. I found a Tarion. It's T-A-R-I-O-N. It's a fantastic bag. It has lots of space, but I filled it up real fast. And I will tell you this, it's rugged. It's made to last. It's comfortable on my back. It's a company in the UK that designs and they're manufactured for them, I'm pretty sure. They, they may not do it themselves. If they do, great job. I will tell you, it's a rugged bag. It's extremely durable. My wife fell in love with mine, so now she has one. Hers is a different model, but they're fantastic. And I saved a bunch of money. If I'd gone to Low Pro or one of the other bags that's out there, I might have paid a lot more. Beware of the cheaper Chinese-made bags that are selling in the $50 range to $30 range. They really are very flimsy. They're not made to last and the straps on the things don't fit very well for someone like me. So bottom line is I'd be afraid of having the bag fall off or come apart. The Tarion bag is very durable, like I said, and it can hold a lot of gear and I feel safe with it. The other thing is it has so many places to store gear. There's a special compartment for memory cards and there's a place in there where you can put your charger and, and the cable, there's an area in there where you could put extra batteries. And I like the fact that I can have lenses and camera bodies in two different places so I can hold 
two of the K1s if I wanted to, K1 Mark II at both ends. But if I'm using big glass too, then that takes away some of the space. So right now I'm using a K1 Mark II in there without a backup body in that bag. But I have several big lenses I'm carrying with me so that I can handle just about anything that comes my way when I'm out there. In the way of tripods, I'd like to show you my tripod, but it's in use right now shooting this particular video. I have a Manfrotto tripod that I've been using for 20 years. I wore out the head of the thing and I put an open panning head on there. The reason I use a panning head is I've been known to shoot and write articles on things like how to photograph air shows or how to photograph amusement parks or photographing auto racing, things like that. And because of moving targets of things like that and even jousting matches and other things that I've done, basically I want a panning head so that I can pan. I shot images of the Blue Angels Navy stunt flying team flying across the infield at a base at over 400 miles an hour panning with the aircraft and photographing them and everything was crystal clear. Once you get used to that, it's actually quite easy as long as the horizon line is actually parallel to the ground so that you're not at an oblique angle. You can pan with that thing successfully and follow aircraft right across the flight line without any problem at all once you get used to matching the speed they're going by. And it doesn't give you much time, but I can tell you after all the years of experience doing this, I know for a fact with a ball head and even a gimbal, I probably could never do that as successfully as I've done it with a panning head. So I have a panning head on my tripod. People question me all the time. With the Oben, there's a like a key lock at one point there that you just turn the, the screw, so to speak, and you can pan left, right with that thing in a fluid motion, even tracking moving wildlife and birds, and I do it all the time. It's pretty successful with that, although if I put a gimbal on there, when they're high in the air, I know I'd be successfully following them there, where now it's a little bit difficult. I have to get them lower in the sky, or I can't track them, because I can't raise that panning head straight up in the air. That's, that's the one limitation of a panning head. I've never seen one yet that could do that because the knobs to tighten and loosen all the functions. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing you want to keep in mind is that when you're out there, you never want to change a lens while you're in the field photographing landscape. Unless you have some kind of enclosure, like a blind, that you can go into, get you out of the wind, and do that, then you can change your lens. But if you're out there in the open air, trust me, in a field full of grasses and things like this, you wouldn't believe how much pollen is in the air, and you're going to get it on the lens of your camera or on your sensor if you're opening the camera and changing lenses all the time. I found out the hard way, and it took a lot of cleaning to get every last little speck of pollen off my sensor. So that is good advice. I'm going to be putting videos online, and I'm going to shoot for one a week, probably on the weekend sometime, like Sunday evening or something like that, I'll upload, and it'll be available week to week. We're going to build a following that way, hopefully, and of course, we're going to have a lot of information at MickeyMcGuirePhoto.com. I wrote a book called Frame That Shot years ago. It's a... Uh, it needs updating. We're going to be doing that real soon, changing some of the images that are in there. And at that point, we'll re-release it. It'll be on Amazon for sale. But right now, that book is actually being given away at MickeyMcGuirePhoto.com. So you can go to that location and uh, sign up, you know, and you will be able to download that book for free in a PDF format. So we took it off of Amazon for that reason. We're going to be updating it, and then, like I said, we'll upload it to Amazon again. We'll be selling the new version of it with a lot more news and information and a lot of technique and things, because this, the cameras, since I wrote that book, have really changed drastically. Back then, 6 megapixel was probably the biggest 
camera and the tens were speculating that they were going to be out in a few months and we were talking about anything beyond 10 or 12 megapixels at that point gets actually to the point where it's creating a lot more noise in your images. Well, that, that's all different today. The technology has really grown and the cameras don't make nearly as much interference, so to speak, electrical interference, which is really that grainy kind of noisy image that you see on things like cell phones and stuff when you, when you take pictures or the little pocket size cameras. And with the digital SLRs, at four to six megapixels, they were very, very smooth until you got the high ISOs. So you could really see it at that point. But now, things have changed so much. We're going to update the book. We're going to be doing a lot of information about lenses and things that are available these days and give people a lot more information on the features of cameras as they are today. Before I go, I'm going to show you one thing here that is really interesting that Pentax has that I really like, and that is on the KP here that my wife uses a lot. There is a setting here where you can open up the LCD on the back so you can look down at the camera and use live view and line up a shot down low, let's say on the edge of a pond where you're wanting to get eye level with a duck. You don't have to lie on your belly in the grass and get bitten by all the jiggers and the other things that are in the grass there or have ticks crawling all over you, anything like that. You'd be able to do it a lot easier that way with this, this LCD screen. Now, I'm going to show you what it looks like on the K1 Mark II because this is really cool. What they've done is they take that same kind of idea, but they built it. If you can see this, there's, there's little metal rods back here that hold this thing, and it can be pivoted around so you can see it a little easier. In addition to that, you can lift this out of the housing that's holding it and bring it up in the air so you can see it from above just like the other one. So you're looking at that, instead of getting down on your belly or whatever, you can photograph on lakes and things just like that. And it gives you a lot easier time viewing things like that. And the live view on this is very, very clear. Now, inside this camera, I, I can't really show you this, but when you look through the viewfinder on this camera, the KP is a full-size prism. So what you see is what you get when you look at the image. This is magnified slightly. The K3 Mark III is the same way. When you look through here, it's easier to see than the KP, and the KP is much easier than previous generations of Pentax digital SLRs. Now, Pentax invented the pentaprism, which is the viewfinder that actually takes you through the lens on these cameras. And for pretty much everyone in the industry had to pay a royalty for that technology originally because Pentax had the rights to it. Now there's all kinds of different ways that people do that. And the mirrorless cameras, what I don't like about those is the fact that you're using the screen on the back to line up every shot. And the rangefinder type of cameras like the Leicas and some of the Mamias and things, they're, they're nice but you have to get used to that. And there's a parallax angle issue when you're close to a target. So those are the way things are. There's a lot of reasons that I choose Pentax. And I'll just say briefly, I switched to Nikon in 2014 and in less than a year I was back to Pentax and I haven't looked back. I shot Pentax for years. I plan on shooting Pentax as long as they are available. And when people ask me why I shoot Pentax, I'll tell you right up front because I believe they have the best lenses in the business. That's my personal belief, my personal feeling. A lot of people won't agree with me. I don't want to debate about it technically because there's a lot of reasons that I've done, you know, I've done this over the years with Pentax and chosen Pentax above everything else. And maybe it's just a personal thing, but I really love Pentax glass. I love their cameras. And it is amazing how customizable Pentax cameras are. Once you play with one, you'll understand there's so many things in the menu you don't see on other makers' cameras that it is astounding. It is absolutely amazing. I'm Mickey McGuire. This is Mickey McGuire Photo channel on YouTube. And if you get a chance, MickeyMcGuirePhoto.com. Take a look. I have a blog. I have news and information. We're going to have 
more stuff in there. There's my gallery online. There's a few videos that I have on this channel already that give you a, an introduction to some of my work. Take a look at Capture the Light, that video. It shows you a little bit of everything I've done. And then some highlights of the Columbus Zoo are in there. And that was shot with video. Just to show people, I do produce video. I've done video for marketing purposes and seminars and things for people. So I do that as a service that I provide. And that is another thing that I'll touch on later on is shooting video when you're going out taking pictures. Uh, you have to be careful with that because it really takes a lot of extra effort to produce videos and do what you're doing. And you may be missing opportunities if you're concentrating on, to, on shooting a video and talking to the camera instead of looking out at what's around you. So that's a personal thought. At any rate, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.